to our web webinar today. It will be presented by Dean Brox and will be showcasing his recently published book, Practical Guide to Rock Tunneling. This webinar is being hosted by the South African National Committee on Tunneling, SANDCOT, and the Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the SAIMM. As a quick introduction, the very first tunneling conference in South Africa, TANCO 1970, was very well supported, and the organizing committee of the conference saw the need for an umbrella organization to cover the interests of tunnel owners, designers, researchers, professional specialists, contractors, and equipment suppliers. And that was in large part due to the extensive infrastructure development that was taking place in South Africa in the late 1960s and foreseen for the decades ahead. This resulted in the formation of the South African National Council on Tunneling in 1973, with Alec Wilson as the first chairperson, and Alec then also represented Sandcott at the inaugural meeting of the then newly formed International Tunneling Association in Oslo in 1974. Now, since those early days, Sandcott has organized many regional symposia and conferences and arranged site visits to various tunneling and underground construction sites. In 2003, Sandcott became a committee and it's now operating as an interest group under the umbrella of the SAIMM. The committee comprises volunteers who meet regularly to collate information on both civil and mining tunneling in South Africa and to organize conferences, site visits, colloquia and webinars such as this one. That said, we're also busy planning at the moment a Sandcott Symposium for November 2022 titled Tunnel Boring in Civil Engineering and Mining. It will be hosted at a venue still to be confirmed in the Cape Winelands. So keep a lookout for conference notices and the call for abstracts, which will come out shortly. If you would like to join Sandcott, membership is free. Just send an email with your details to Google Charlie at the SAIMM and ask her to add your name to our Sandcott mailing list. And I've posted her email address in the chat if you can just have a look there. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gerard Keiter. I'm the current chairman of Sandcott. And at this point, I wish to thank Monique Weinstein, as one of our Sandcott committee members who helped organize this webinar. And I would also like to thank Camila Jardine and Google Charlie at the SAIMM Secretariat for setting this all up for us and for so competently managing all administrative matters relating to this webinar. That said, this webinar is providing, it's aimed at providing us with an introduction to Dean's practical guide to rock tunneling with a specific focus on the many tunneling case studies that he presented in the book. And we're very fortunate in this regard in that Dean has kindly agreed to present this lecture. Dean is a Canadian and graduated from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in 1985, where he received his degree in geological engineering, geotechnical. And in 1990, he received his master of science in rock mechanical engineering with distinction from Imperial College in, Lon in London. Dean has 36 years of experience in the tunneling industry, including involvement in the planning, design, construction, operation, and inspection stages. In total, Dean reckoned he's worked on more than 1,500 kilometers of large tunnels, including 575 kilometers of mining tunnels and 525 kilometers of hydroelectric tunnels. He's a registered professional engineer and independent consultant specializing in risks, claims, and reviews. Specific areas of specialization and interests include planning and execution of geotechnical investigations, characterization of rocks with in-situ stress tests and specialist, specialized laboratory tests, evaluation of tunnel boring machines for mining projects, risk assessments, acceptability of unlined and shock reclined pressure tunnels, assessment and prediction of overstress, including rock bursting in deep tunnels, forensic investigation of tunnel collapses and evaluation of the structural conditions of hydroelectric tunnels through underwater inspections with remote control vehicles. Thank you, Dean. We are looking forward to your presentation today. I now hand the proceedings over to Monique. She'll be presiding over the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Monique. Thank you, Gerard. Um... Camilla, would you mind um, allowing my uh, video to start? There we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Gerard. 
So I'll be facilitating the question and answer session um, for Adine's uh, talk today. Uh, we'd just like to start with a couple of uh, uh, rules for the conference. If you could please all keep your mics on mute and your cameras off during his presentation. Uh, as I've said, I'll be facilitating the question and answer session, which will be at the end of the presentation. If you could post your questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. So that's the Q&A box and not in the chat. Um, those, uh, Dean, we'll allow approximately 10 minutes for the Q&A session, uh, perhaps a little bit longer, time dependent. And if, if there are further questions, Dean will be answering these offline at a later stage. And then lastly, in terms of your CPD points, uh, you'll be allocated half a CPD point for every one hour that you're online. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to hand over to Dean. Thanks very much, Dean. Oh, there we go. Uh, hello, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, thank you to uh, Gerhard and the team for the invitation uh, to present this uh, webinar. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay and, and the system's working fine. I'll jump right in and as we said, we'll uh, leave the questions uh, to the end um, and try and get through as many of those as possible. Uh, perhaps we might finish a little early. We'll see how things go here. And there we go. So um, this book was produced um, and published, uh, first of all, in 2017. Um, it was uh, launched at the uh, World Tunnel Conference in Bergen, Norway that year, which was the annual um, venue for the um, uh, the International Tunneling Association conferences that are that are held around the world. Uh, this year, the uh, conference has been delayed into September now. They're usually hosted in, in the month of May or so. And uh, this year, it's going to be in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, so that was a good opportunity at the time uh, to, to launch the book and get it out there, as you can see, with a number of other books that... Uh, were available from the publisher at, at Taylor Francis and CRC Press, who uh, publish a lot of good technical books in the industry. And since then, um, I've done an update uh, just last year, actually, um, thinking that there was uh, much more to add as, as time goes on, even over uh, just a, the timing of a, a few years to include some additional case histories and some additional lessons learned and, and information. I think it's uh, it's an ongoing uh, process of learning in this particular technical field with, with experience. And there's a lot of great projects out there around the world. I've been very fortunate enough to have worked on some. Um, and that's what I hope to be able to present to you today with some of the lessons learned from some of those. So the new book is now available also in hardcover now, finally, Amazon and Kindle at their bookstores printing um, hardcover versions. There are the ebook versions available, of course, as well, uh, which is a downloadable PDF version. So all of that is available if you just Google it onto um, Amazon and Kindle. And, and of course, um, I've done a lot of work uh, over my career in uh, South America and with many friends and colleagues down there. I was asked a few years ago for a Spanish version, and then even last year, a Portuguese version. And I was lucky enough to find some really good colleagues uh, in the industry that took their time out to do the translations because to get the technical translations correct was obviously very important. And now those uh, versions are also available uh, via Amazon and Kindle. So the contents of uh, more or less of the book <clears throat> and today's webinar uh, basically follows through the, the various chapters of the book. Um, 
There was um, I think one on health and safety at the end, which I won't I won't go on to today. I think we'll keep it mainly technical. So we'll just uh, we'll go through this, and and it's meant to be a high level um, uh, review essentially of of the book. And as you can imagine, with these types of um, headings of the various chapters, which covers a broad range of of tunneling and rock and the various uh, aspects of them. Um, there have actually been books written on just even some of these discrete chapters. Uh, each of these chapters in themselves uh, contain a lot of detailed <clears throat> information um, that, that exists out there in the industry and people have uh, dived into and, and published uh, uh, books and publications, obviously technical papers, but even books on such as um, contract strategy and, and other uh, types of uh, information so the the objective of the uh, of the book was uh, kind of an interesting uh backstory i guess um just to look at um when i got into uh the field uh, over 30 years ago and and uh, i can say i actually started my professional career in south africa um even though i, I grew up in this part of the world in western canada uh, there was no work uh, at the time, so I, I was very fortunate to uh, get a position down there on the on the um, uh, on the Vits uh, deep gold mines, and then eventually into the Lesotho Highlands project. And uh, looking at um, all the all the tunneling work that was going on there, and when I looked back uh, some years ago, when I first started this book, to realize that there wasn't a really good introduction book. Uh, that I thought it existed in the industry to write something like that. So the intent was to put together a sort of high level roadmap <clears throat> of all the different aspects from planning all the way through to the inspection of tunnels. Um, it's obviously, I think, uh, can be um, uh, considered by students, whether uh, undergraduates or even postgraduates in the industry together with clients. And even for some, uh, shall I say, even some colleagues that, that have many years of experience, uh, I've received some uh, interesting comments that they weren't aware of certain aspects. And obviously, if some of it comes down to personal experience. So there's, there was the intent of not repeating any, any theory that can be found in past publications throughout many decades, and uh, tried to focus really on some practical aspects that um, you know, really come from uh, industry experience and working on particular projects. And just starting with the, the different uses of tunnels. And um, it's easy to forget um, that tunnels uh, are used for many different aspects for, for common infrastructure for society. Um, obviously, um, you know, the main, the main, let's call it business sectors in, in civil engineering for urban and, and even uh, non-urban infrastructure. But uh, in, and in the mining industry, uh, I look at it for the hydropower as a sort of a different industry because it's a very different uh, subset of design requirements as, as such. And then also even in the oil and gas or petroleum industry, where there's been also many tunnels built for pipelines and various uh, infrastructure <clears throat> that are particularly for that. So many different uh, uses for tunnels there. Some of uh, you might be familiar with and others not. Um, but um, as we see in today's world, um, you know, most of the tunnels being built are for water supply, uh, sewage uh, and traffic in particular. And then of course, for mass transit, uh, for getting people around cities. Um, and then in, in the uh, non-urban areas, we see obviously a lot of ongoing tunneling for mining projects and, and hydroelectric in, in very remote um, mountainous regions of the world. Uh, one of the key um, uh, aspects and, and, and subject matter, I think that there, there hasn't been a lot written about uh, sort of at a high level or introductory level was all about I call it execution and execution, meaning that uh, where do we start when, when a client um, uh, is interested to, uh, to have a tunnel or needs a tunnel or becomes perhaps the, the ultimate solution? Because as we probably know that tunnels are 
are one of the most expensive solutions. And uh, having been involved on many different studies, it's, um, it, it is the last means to find solutions sometimes, but it's becoming a very common solution around the world today with, uh, with the use of underground space and, and, and the, the buildup of all the, the large cities around the world and the limited space that there exists or remains on surface. But we have to start with uh, aspects of project delivery and there's different approaches there. Uh, that the client needs to consider and make decisions about early on, or at least to be educated about, uh, to know the options that are available for execution. Um, and then, of course, going through the different steps of, of planning, and we can call those conceptual design through to different types of trade-offs, uh, going through different levels of uh, pre-feasibility and feasibility levels of design, and if the project continues um, with interest from the client and, and the community and everyone and all the environmental acceptability that may go with it, hopefully, uh, into a final design that then eventually goes into construction, but obviously still through a tender process and such. So there's a lot of aspects required for that, uh, different uh, deliverables that are important for clients to recognize, to have their consultants and designers prepare as part of good practice. So there's good quality control and checking throughout all the different stages of a design process. Uh, risk management, risk registers are, are a lot. We'll talk about that a bit more. Um, and it's just all of the important deliverables, again, whether it's at the end of the day, we have to produce uh, technical drawings that, that contractors can visually see and then go out into the site and build these according to the, uh, the geometry that's, that has been designed and all the technical specifications that go along with it. And then of course, there's other important contractual documents that have to be prepared uh, when we finally proceed into construction as well. And I'll talk a bit more about those as well, uh, both geotechnical data reports, uh, there's interpretive reports that are used for internal design purposes. And then, of course, there's the what's referred to as the baseline report that's used as part of a contract um, execution situation. Site investigations, um, sort of one of the key early steps in any major tunneling project, uh, whether it's in rock or or any medium. And site investigations, of course, is is a is a big challenge, um, but it's what we base our overall designs are on. It's the actual, it's the fundamental data from the ground that, that we will rely on to, to make all our design assumptions and criteria and, and obviously to build in eventually. So it's a very important aspect to, uh, to consider. And one of the uh, most challenging questions I have uh, received uh, many times by different clients and, and continue to ask ourselves is how much investigations are, are necessary for any particular project and that's not a simple uh, question to answer uh, it never is on any particular project every every project site has uh, is different uh, in terms of its um, geological background but also for access whether we're, we're up in high mountainous regions where it makes for difficult uh, access um, where we may need helicopters as, as such and where, because there's no roads or perhaps boat access only. Um, some of us um, <clears throat> who have been involved, for instance, up in the, up in the highlands of Lusutu and other mountainous regions in the world uh, are very used to and comfortable with um, the, the safety aspects of being able to do that type of work. And it, it is all doable in, in a safe manner, but it still has a lot of challenges. Um, but um, there, there has to be a, a well-planned uh, approach for site investigations. Um, and, and typically I like to view things to be, uh, to advise clients that uh, we're never gonna be going out there once. Uh, we should always consider a multiple phased approach to site investigations because we learn as we go. We find out information that perhaps we did not expect. Uh, we're going to have uh, information or data gaps in our overall database that sometimes we only realize after a particular field season uh, is available. And we come back and we only realize that once we're back in the office 
interpreting all of the information and therefore uh, typically justifying to go back out to do a, a new stage or phase of investigations to um, directly target specific areas and, and gather additional information. And there's, there's lots of different uh, techniques available. Um, some of those are again presented. I won't go into them in detail. A lot of it's traditional uh, techniques that probably most of you are familiar with, but it's, um, it's looking at it in a phased approach and making sure that we get all the information that's necessary um, that's such that we can carry out our designs. And I've, I've found uh, a useful graph I've, I've commonly referred to. Sometimes it's dangerous actually, but it comes from Hook and Paul Mary uh, published back in 1998. Actually, it was presented here in Vancouver at the International Engineering Geological Conference back then. Um, this is a series of data points that uh, they put together based on World Bank uh, deep uh, and, and major hydroelectric projects that gave an indication of the cost overruns and cost estimates from contractors as a function of the amount of drilling that was done in relation to the tunnel length, uh, as you can see on the x-axis there. <clears throat> and as you might intuitively expect that the more drilling you do, um, you might expect less surprises and therefore a lower cost overrun associated with a particular project. Um, while that sounds all good in theory and, and sounds intuitive, it's always not the case, of course. And, and there's other extreme data points that one could uh, chart up on a plot like this to show that there's been uh, yeah, some extreme situations where there's been a lot of drilling and yet they found major surprises and, and cost overruns during construction, but, but in general, uh, that sort of relationship, I think, stands true. It doesn't help you exactly, and one should use this as a direct uh, gauge, I think, to say, Mr. Client, if you don't drill this much, you can expect this amount of cost overrun, because that could be a very sort of dangerous and scary tactic, perhaps, to present to a client. But sometimes those tactics are actually necessary to educate clients that they do have to allocate appropriate budgets uh, for particular sites that may be associated with very complex geology and that warrant some very detailed investigations. <clears throat> Another chart I put together based on a number of <clears throat> projects I was familiar with shows the actual amount of drilling versus tunnel length. Um, and it was just interesting to see how that all charts up for various projects around the world, various geological environments, uh, different tunnel lengths and, and such. Um, what does that really tell us at the end? And, and does it mean anything in terms of different types of projects, uh, mining tunnels versus tunnels where, that were, where, where TBMs were used versus drill and blast? Um, still a bit of a scatter plot, but does it give us an indication of anything of the sort? And what does that really mean? That if there is a relationship that should we be doing perhaps a minimum of, the, of around 30% uh, of drilling versus our tunnel length. Uh, again, one has to, I think, uh, treat this carefully and consider the real complexity or the perceived complexity of your particular site <clears throat> in terms of its uh, geological nature and such. And some sites can be very simplistic and others can be much more complex, of course. And that's, that's why we have to um, carry out investigations to get that database that we can rely on for design. Um, just some of the, uh, one of the techniques, of course, that um, uh, I was involved with here on a project in Hong Kong many years ago, where uh, we had limited access to do vertical drilling above the tunnel in a major urban environment uh, such as Hong Kong. And therefore we ended up doing a very long um, horizontal hole uh, with specialized uh, drilling equipment. And so that was one of the longest um, holes that uh, I've ever uh, been aware of actually in the industry. And uh, perhaps there's been some other long sub-vertical drilling of course uh, in the world on some deep projects, but uh, sometimes we have to go to such highly specialized approaches uh, again, uh, if we have certain constraints where we are in our project site. Uh, characterization, 
um, this is obviously diving into the details of all the interpretation of the information that we get from site investigations. And this is, of course, a huge topic um, uh, that I, I, again, I go briefly into it at a high level in the book, presenting some typical examples of the importance of, for example, the quality control of laboratory testing. Um, we have to, we should be very careful in our practices that we just do not assume that everything we sent to the lab and get back is, is done correctly. There's, um, Every, uh, we're all human and, and errors can be made uh, in testing procedures and the like. And even though if certain laboratories are uh, accredited in certain um, jurisdictions, um, it, one still has to be cognizant of the fact that uh, errors can be made and, and double checks should always be done. I'm a big fan of actually doing, uh, let's call it check testing. So we, we may use a particular lab for testing but uh, if, if there are particular properties that uh, are very important for our design, that maybe we want to send additional samples to a second lab and really confirm um, those, those, um, uh, the initial results that we do have. And again, um, going through all that. One of the um, new aspects um, I included in this, the updated version of the book was, was looking at deep in situ stress testing the chart on the left there is uh, some results that I've put together on a number of uh, some recent projects, deep projects in the world uh, together with other ones. And that's really, it represents an update to the Hook and Brown book from 1980, where they first published a similar plot uh, with some data, but not quite as deep. But um, we've, we've discovered with some recent projects around the world that we are starting to see much higher in situ stresses at greater depth. Than, than previously expected or based on, let's call it the, the old school of thought. And basically, again, it's all a matter of um, an additional database is showing us information that um, is a little different from earlier trends in the industry <clears throat> to be aware of. And again, we're starting to see longer and deeper tunnels being planned and designed and built around the world. And some of these projects have experienced some very significant challenges in terms of um, overstressing and rock bursting, which is all related to worker safety and constructability. And so again, it goes back to the importance of doing good site investigations, uh, doing some of the basic testing, even though it can be very expensive and challenging. And of course, interpreting and characterizing that information correctly, such that it is being um, recognized in the design and disclosed ultimately to contractors such that they understand the risks and whether or not that uh, impacts the type of equipment that may be necessary or some of the safety procedures that have to be adopted during construction. Um, then jumping into some of the, uh, the key design aspects um, uh, for, tunnel, for tunnel design, uh, looking at, and, and I know this, this relates more perhaps to the engineers that are going to be involved and responsible for the designs and, and, and drawings and such, and looking at what particular standards or codes may be applicable, if any at all. Sometimes um, there's, there's not a lot out there in the industry. I do give a list in the book of, of many uh, attempted codes and standards mm -hmm. from around the world. Obviously, our International Tunneling Association uh, has ongoing working groups within itself to prepare new documents. Um, and that's, it's always, it's an ongoing challenge of getting people to volunteer their time to write about best practices as procedures. But um, some of those documents that, that they're all available on the ITA website uh, can be very useful as, as certainly as um, guidelines to, to consider. Um, but uh, <clears throat> designs need to take into account uh, both the construction aspects and, and ultimately the operational requirements of any particular tunnel. And obviously it's intended design life. Um, are we talking about short-term tunnels that may be uh, required in a mining situation or just for temporary access for other infrastructure, or of course, rather than um, long-term design lives that typically many people refer to a hundred year design life 
uh, out in the industry for civil engineering infrastructure. Uh, what we're seeing today with uh, <clears throat> many new major mine projects around the world and, and based on, uh, let's call it mega reserves on some of these new deposits that they're finding, that some of these mine lives could be in excess of 50 years. And therefore, it may be appropriate to start to adopt um, engineering standards that are actually more applicable to civil engineering projects, because we, we do want to limit the amount of maintenance that may be required on our tunnels, um, because it could have a huge impact on operations, at a, for instance, at a particular long life mine. <clears throat> and so that's, a, that's an important aspect to consider. Uh, without going, uh, let's call it overboard or overly conservative by introducing um, yeah, a, 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 a civil engineering approach on a particular mining project. Uh, and I know having worked a lot in the mining industry, some of the mining clients could be very sensitive to that and, and to not want to see that um, their infrastructure is being over designed because they are willing to, to undertake maintenance, but to a certain extent. And of course, they don't want uh, a tunnel design that could become a maintenance nightmare for them during operations and have huge impacts. So just some of the, the important aspects to consider. And one, one of them, of course, also tunnel constructability evaluation to make sure that any design that is created is actually buildable uh, in a practical way with today's available equipment in the industry. And um, so those are all important aspects to, to consider. Um, and one of my particular uh, points of interest, uh, subjects of interest in the industry is, is hydropower tunnels. And I've uh, jumped into uh, looking at a number of aspects related to them. And uh, of course, with uh, hydropower, uh, it's all about economics, and therefore, if we do not have to provide a, a final lining in those tunnels, those projects can be much more economic, or sometimes can only be economic uh, without lining, and therefore, we call them unlined tunnels. But there's been a number of failures of projects over the years, and this <clears throat> this uh, was meant to give a snapshot of some of the failures that have occurred, and in particular, over the last, um, let's see, it's been 14 years now, We've had uh, a number of cases of early failures of these types of tunnels for some various reasons, but also some consistent reasons. And I'll talk about that a bit more on, on some of the, with the, the case histories coming up. So it's, um, it's an important aspect under design. And again, the, I, I refer to it as the acceptability of unlined tunnels. And that's where we have to be very careful in our geological environments uh, to allow um, <clears throat> water to pass through those tunnels under pressure and typically oscillating pressures. And that's why hydroelectric or hydraulic tunnels are a very unique subset of, of tunnels in the industry because um, we're not just passing air or vehicles or subway trains through them. We're now putting water in. When water comes into contact with certain uh, geologic properties, some very strange things uh, can happen as we've learn from some of these failures. Um, and some of those key failures that have occurred are listed here that um, I've been involved with on various aspects. Of course, when failures occur, it's, it's never a good situation, but of course it has drastic impacts on the delays to these projects because hydropower projects depend on, on first the economics, but of course, at the end of the day, it's about selling the electricity. Um, and that gets into contractual matters where there is a builder or a developer selling that power to possibly a, a national utility or authority. Um, and therefore it's very important that those pro projects do get built on time and on budget. And, but when we have failures such as these that have occurred around the world, um, there's various investigations or post uh, forensic investigations that occur and of course everybody wants to know why and uh, and obviously then who's responsible was it a design error or was it a construction quality error um, and all those different difficult questions have to be uh, or, or should I say are are asked and they're not easy ones to answer sometimes but just to give you a bit of a, a flavor of some of those 
uh, failures and, and some of the key ones that have occurred in recent times. And the question is why why is that and such? So I'll, I'll touch on that a bit more later on some of the case histories. Um, the next sort of uh, subject matter in, 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 you know, as part of design, of course, is looking at the stability of tunnels. And in today's world, we're very spoiled to have all this excellent software that's been developed, um, some of it very new and, and some of it still ongoing by different companies out there. Um, I think it's all becoming uh, much more user friendly and available to us. Obviously, it's the, um, the difficulty or the challenges remain of having good input data for such analysis, but they are, of course, great tools um, to have in the toolbox uh, at our disposal for, for helping us to understand stability behavior and for design purposes. And there's also other uh, techniques that have been uh, evolved out there. Um, I'll talk about some of those as well, because one of them is, it relates to, again, as I mentioned before, the related risks on deep tunnels and overstressing and, and rock bursting in particular. And um, because there, that's where I've developed a new method of assessment or preliminary assessment, maybe to call it, um, to look into that. So um, not too much to say more on this is, uh, again, uh, tried not to repeat too much in the book that from other stuff that's been available, but I think in today's world, uh, a lot of the software speaks for itself. And again, the greatest challenge that remains is, is having a good um, uh, data information to uh, as input. And of course, then the interpretation of, of results and what that really means and turning that into practical designs uh, that can be constructed. Um, and just just with that, one of the examples on, on the details of looking at overstressing and these examples here of a, uh, this was actually a tunnel here in Vancouver where we did experience rock bursting conditions that um, became a real safety concern to the contractor. Uh, we were only uh, just at, at uh, 500, 600 meters depth. This was an unexpected situation during construction. Um, and um, so looking at it and what happened and, and why was the case um, when we when we had uh, a limited data set of some of the rock information and rock strengths and um, and actually at the time prior to construction no information about the expected in situ stresses so it was a it was a difficult lesson learned from all of us on the design side uh, to present that to the client and and to understand and to um, uh, basically present what happened and why happened uh, but obviously its impacts on the on potential uh, uh, construction techniques that have to be modified during construction and, and safer procedures to be used. Uh, tunnel excavation um, that comes in as obviously an important aspect to consider on uh, as as designers we still have to be expected to think about how our projects are likely to be built, even though uh, we, we may specify it to some degree, but not the exact detailed types of equipment for a contractor to use. Um, we, know, we know about obviously the, the typical methods uh, available in the industry of using drill, the traditional conventional drill and blast methods and the use of tunnel boring machines um, and other, there's other innovations that are coming along in the industry as well. Uh, there are there are specialized techniques, for instance, uh, that middle photo of using what what is referred to as high speed drill and blast methods for long tunnels. And um, uh, a, a new sort of logic chart that I've put together and included in the new version of the book there down below is sort of a, a, a logic chart looking at uh, the use of different types of TBMs and some of the key criteria that could be considered to arrive at the most suitable type of TBM for a particular long tunnel project. So again, excavation methods is, is something that's, uh, it is necessary to, to be evaluated during the early um, periods of a design to confirm technical viability, um, that those methods are, are most applicable. And of course, part of it is uh, dependent on the any constraints at the at the project site, and and access in terms of how many portals 
Uh, are there intermediate access edits that could be available that can therefore influence the type of excavation methods that could be there? Um, and obviously, what's the most suitable, um, let's call it technically in terms of overall stability. Uh, and so obviously consideration of the geotechnical conditions is also important to bring in. And um, obviously with the use of tunnel boring machines, uh, there are limited, uh, let's call it recommendations in the industry as to when, when can one uh, apply a tunnel boring machine. Um, well, we can say that TBMs have uh, bust through basically some very difficult geotechnical conditions around the world. Uh, obviously, there's been projects where there's been major delays. Um, there are, um, I'll call it rather, rumors that uh, you know TBMs cannot work in certain geology, and that's that's absolutely false. Um, as again, I've said, they've struggled through some very difficult projects and, and have completed things, but obviously with delays, there's been a few TBMs that have become uh, trapped or stuck, um, and also for extended periods of time. Uh, but um, I was aware of one, one situation where a client was told that there were, I think, over a dozen TBMs stuck in the Andes in South America. And um, I quickly refuted that because after checking with a few colleagues in the industry, we, we, we were able to confirm that there was only ever one that was actually ever trapped permanently. Um, but there was obviously some, many projects where uh, they've struggled through some difficult geology. And again, with extended delays, sometimes up to six months or even a year. Um, and sometimes even such delays <clears throat> or risk events that, that may occur during construction um, can still result in the completion of a project much faster than using conventional methods. But again, it all depends on the, the number of attacks that may be available for a particular project um, to, to look at. So uh, tunnel excavation, it's a huge subject on its own and diving into the, the information of um, you know uh, explosives design, blasting design, and obviously all the details with different tunnel boring machines is a whole detailed subject on its own. Um, and again, I give some examples of that because again, TBMs are one of my uh, particular uh, favorite subjects to look into and, and looking at their applicability for various projects. <clears throat> and just uh, I wanted to introduce some of the, the innovations that have uh, come along in the industry, both for shafts and tunnels. <clears throat> we have the vertical shaft machine from Heron Connect in Germany now being used on many any relatively short shafts uh, and typically through overburdened materials there in the lower right corner and even being set up in, in major urban uh, areas, um, you know, on a small footprint. So it's a very, very effective and efficient uh, technique that's, that's come out into the industry and um, it's seen some really good applications on, on a number of uh, urban projects so far. Um, and then they have a version of a rotating sort of um, road header cutting disc uh, disc cutter uh, machine for into uh, softer rocks or shall I say yeah, lower strength rocks haven't been able to see that used yet in very strong rock conditions and then on the flip side of things uh, looking at uh, smaller diameter tunnel boring machines that have been innovated now and come out into the industry um, and to to be able to do long tunnels and in this case a particular uh, the hydroelectric tunnel in Norway in very hard rock. So a very unique set of cir circumstances where um, obviously a, a small diameter was, was all that was actually required, uh, but yet a, uh, an appreciable length and in very hard rock conditions. So versus um, using conventional drill and blast of a small tunnel, uh, some of these innovations can be much more cost-effective. And finally, and you, some of you may have seen this just uh, finally released to the public uh, recently, I think a few months ago, it was the, um, the innovation from the Robbins Company in the States, um, who have been one of the key, uh, one of the key TBM manufacturers in the world, came out with this mining um, TBM, they're calling it MDM 5000, 
that has been on trials at the Fresnillo mine in Mexico in volcanic geology, basalts and andesites, and basically producing a flat floor, which is, uh, as, as some of us know, is a great desire for mining engineers um, for whatever reasons. And uh, But it gives that type of geometry at the end of the day. Uh, the trials that are that continue to ongo, uh, going through some more challenging conditions, but allow for uh, concurrent installation of, of uh, ground support uh, to provide a, uh, a safe uh, tunnel. And then, of course, to allow all the services and everything else to be included in it as required. But it's a short trial section underway at the moment, and we'll see where that uh, technology advances in the industry. So I thought it was uh, very interesting to see that underway and uh, to see where it goes. Uh, tunnel support, another um, very important aspect. Again, dealt in the book um, with talking briefly about the, the traditional types of support that are out there that have been successfully used in the industry. I've uh, taken it uh, a step further uh, in the particular application for ground support for the use of TBMs in that lower chart to derive what, um, what some of you might recognize as a similar chart to that from uh, NGI and, and traditional uh, drill and blast ground support with different classes based on, on uh, TBM diameter. And that's been based on uh, 55 case histories now to date, where we see that with, with tunnel boring machines, we can uh, in some ways simplify some of the ground support there up in the upper upper left, uh, putting in some different types of components, but there's, there's different access and different procedures that are used uh, to achieve the same requirement for safety and short-term stability or, or maybe even long-term stability in tunnels. So again, just some new uh, additions that have been included in the book. And of course, uh, to look at um, uh, or consider in, in, in terms of ground support, again, the, the so-called design life of a particular tunnel um, and whether or not there's going to be the possibility for maintenance and replacement of any of that support? Uh, can there be corrosion that's ongoing from acidic groundwater is, a, is an important aspect to consider. Commonly associated in and around mining projects, uh, we know, but um, in, in could be in a, some other special uh, environments as well, where, where we have uh, adverse conditions that may impact the longevity of ground support that needs to be considered. And then into tunnel lining and tunnel linings, of course, uh, let's call these uh, that are still required in, in, in rock tunnels, even in sometimes very good rock uh, quality conditions where we may just get away with some very simple uh, versions of shotcrete lining, uh, whether it's for uh, hydraulic tunnels or hydroelectric tunnels. Uh, one of the important aspects to consider um, with the um, construction of, of final linings, of course, and, and in particular for conventional tunnels, is, is the time time required for the cleaning of floors. And as you see in the upper right photo there, um, it's typically underestimated in terms of both cost and schedule and, and the time that's really needed to do that, to have a, if that's what's actually required as a, as a concrete floor. Um, and we get into, with tunnel boring machines, the use of precast uh, concrete linings uh, are, are now well-established practice in the industry, including for hydraulic and hydroelectric tunnels. And I'm a big fan of that particular design approach. It's a low-risk approach, particularly when we have uh, potentially adverse geotechnical or non-durable rock conditions uh, versus uh, trying to line geological fault or non-durable rock only with shotcrete. And those are some of the lessons learned uh, in the industry. Uh, and then of course we have in our lower left corner, the traditional concrete lining and full sort of sandwich uh, membrane design approach for subway or metro types of tunnels for civil engineering infrastructure and urban environments where we, we cannot uh, have any leakage going on into those types of facilities that, that Become, that can become drastic uh, maintenance 
requirements during operations. Uh, then some of the other important aspects that a lot of people don't recognize uh, for construction. And again, it comes down to uh, if you've ever had the opportunity working on a design build approach, where basically uh, you may be engaged uh, working directly with a contractor and um, you have to get involved in all these other, maybe let's call it uh, secondary or less technical aspects, but they're still very important to be planned out uh, for a particular project site um, because they're, they're needed as part of construction. And that relates to having the necessary space around portal sites, uh, bringing in the infrastructure that's required, whether it's uh, water supply, the electrical power that may be needed. And then of course, all the, um, the, um, the water treatment facilities that are necessary as well. And of course, that's uh, one of the most important aspects on, on projects these days is making sure that we're in full compliance with all the environmental requirements before any discharge of construction water, which is always dirty water, um, whether it's just from sediment or just from oils and such that are used during construction. So some of these are just, um, I call them the construction consideration aspects uh, of, of uh, part of design and planning that, that also need to be considered in the early planning stages to make sure that we are addressing these aspects um, as part of our work. <clears throat> and with some of that, uh, now we, again, with the, um, the uh, what we have available with computer software, we can do all the pre-planning of uh, waste, waste uh, sites as such, another uh, important aspect in terms of the environmental uh, compliance and such, and to get some of that information. So even our early design and planning work has to sometimes go uh, hand in hand concurrently with environmental impact assessment reports. And we, we need to identify where's the spoil sites, uh, whether they're temporary or permanent, uh, and to build those in, in the early days and get those approvals. And just looking at the different types of uh, potential use of um, uh, tunnel spoil material that comes out, depending on the method of excavation. And uh, sometimes that material can be, can be used for road base and all sorts of things, sometimes even for concrete aggregate, if it, if it is acceptable and goes through all the, the various testing procedures. But in many cases, uh, where we have uh, altered rock and such, we know that that material is not going to be able to be used for any other purposes and sometimes has to go through the detailed um, evaluation, whether it's um, acid generating or non-acid generating during the, uh, the construction phase of the project <clears throat> and to have multiple spoil sites available uh, depending on its actual type um, based on its test results. Uh, then. Moving into um, you know one of the, the, the critical aspects I mentioned earlier was was about risk and um, uh, addressing risk and how it comes into and how it should come into uh, the early stages of planning and design uh, because it's all about recognizing what can go wrong during construction that leads to delays and cost overruns of course which is not desired by anyone. And if there's in particular any impacts to even the communities or other uh, third party stakeholders on a project. <clears throat> so that's that's introducing, of course, uh, risk workshops and risk registers, but just having uh, risk as part of um, the fundamental approach on design to try and de-risk and have low risk approaches as much as possible, again, without being overly conservative uh, on our designs. and. Uh, those photos are from a, um, a hydroelectric tunnel in Sri Lanka where major inflows were experienced. Um, it was actually a, uh, I'll call it a medium deep tunnel, four to 500 meters that still caused settlement on surface to the local communities. Uh, some major damage to, to some of the houses. So something that was um, not carefully identified during, uh, during the early stages with the actual approach that are uh, that was used for construction. <clears throat> and again, oops, uh, some of the, the different types of uh, risk mitigation that can be used um, and has been used successfully 
depending on the types of projects, whether it's pilot tunnels for you know new major traffic tunnels, that's a pretty common uh, approach used uh, out there in the industry and has done historically and, and has been successful, of course. Uh, call it a pilot tunnel or exploration tunnel. Sometimes it's even used as a pre-drainage tunnel if, 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 if there's uh, high risks of large uh, groundwater uh, to be expected. <clears throat> that allows to um, you know get an understanding uh, before the, the main contracts, for example. And, and again, sometimes those those um, exploration tunnels or pilot tunnels can be done as an advanced contract, um, which is a great benefit to, to some major projects. And just the use of uh, drainage and other uh, typical conventional risk mitigation tools that exist in the industry to be, to be used and have been used effectively to uh, lower the risk during construction. Uh, cost estimating and scheduling is a, I'll call it a pretty high, highly specialized subject on its own, but it's a, it's a fundamental requirement um, in, again, the overall planning and design of tunnels. Um, you know, this typically engages um, specialist individuals that, that, that have that particular background. It's not for everyone, of course, and um, it's very important to um, get the correct, uh, let's, let's call it numbers at the end of the day, uh, which, which of course, any client, whether it's a public project or a private project, it's all important. How much is it going to cost and how long is it going to take? And of course, even... Um, uh, maybe more so the schedules are important, more so for politicians that uh, are, may, may be associated with certain projects or uh, get involved with them and um, have aspects to, to talk about. So um, I just uh, present some of the traditional good practices on uh, construction cost estimating in the, in the book using the um, American um, uh, 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 procedures of different levels, classes one to five of different estimates and the different levels of work and assumptions that are required to do that level of work and, and effort. And there is a lot of effort that goes into cost estimating and scheduling to get it correct. And of course, both those aspects have to be consistent with each other because the um, time is money. And uh, it's as, it, basically it's as simple as that. Uh, the longer tunnels uh, and, and um, Longer duration projects, of course, are going to cost more uh, versus others. Um, and contract strategy, uh, I understand and or was aware that you guys did have a webinar uh, from the, the FIDIC guys on the new Emerald book. So that was a good thing to hear about. And that's a great addition, again, in the toolbox to have in the industry. Uh, and I guess we're still waiting for its first particular use of the Emerald contract book in practice. I'm not aware of anyone that's adopted it yet or nobody has claimed to have used it yet. Um, we thought we might take uh, advantage of it uh, in Lesotho on the next contract coming up, but uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of different strategies out there for clients to consider. And again, this is part of the planning process of a, of a project for the, for the owner to uh, to become familiar and if they have to be educated with all the different types of contracts that can be executed, um, there's good and bad, there's no perfect contract that exists in the industry, unfortunately. Um, but that um, the, the new Emerald book, I think is a, is a good uh, start and we'll see how it, uh, how um, it hopefully has success in, in some of the future projects that come out. But again, another uh, quite a specialized topic uh, in terms of contract management strategy um, as part of the planning for, for new projects. Uh, again, risk management, won't say too much more on this. And, and again, I don't I actually don't dive into it too much. Um, you know, it's all about having uh, risk workshops and having multiple workshops and updating of risk registers throughout the life of a project all the way into construction. And I think a lot of people forget about that, and in particular clients just think it's a, a box ticking exercise that should be done uh, at 100% design before we go to tender. And, and again, um, there's a lot of good things to learn and, and from risk management and, and workshops that help even designers identify things that they may have not thought about. 
and even for clients. Um, you know, just putting everything down on paper makes you recognize things that need to be addressed as part of planning and design for a new project. So again, it's um, the importance of respecting it as a um, as a sort of a, a living uh, um, aspect of any particular project, and it's not just a one stop uh, situation to to do. And and that's where I also I've said that it's uh, <clears throat> it can be very useful to bring in fresh eyes or some independent individuals. That's commonly done maybe from the client side, but sometimes if it, it can be initiated from the actual design consultant themselves uh, because um, sometimes um, individuals get uh, let's call it even tunnel vision uh, by working on a particular project for too long and uh, it's easy to uh, not not identify certain relevant aspects and and sometimes that's the benefit of bringing in people that are that haven't been involved and they can help to identify um, uh, situations or risks that that have not been identified previously. The inspection of tunnels, um, sorry, um, uh, another particular uh, favorite subject of mine in particular for hydraulic and hydroelectric tunnels. <clears throat> of course, um, tunnel inspections can apply to all types of tunnels, whether they are their main access tunnels at a mine, um or um traffic tunnels of course you know major national roads those those have to be inspected or should be on a on a frequent basis as well and maintenance carried out as required <clears throat> in today's world we now have again some, some technology available that's also rapidly improving year by year with with uh, certain um, equipment uh, that can be used and these in particular these uh remote operated vehicles that can be put into hydraulic tunnels. So again, uh, we don't have to empty the tunnels, but that, that, that in itself can cause damage to some tunnels, depending on how they were originally designed and built. And in the book, and uh, recently I've published some, some new recommendations for the industry regarding the frequency of inspections of uh, hydraulic tunnels uh, shown there down in the lower left box but again i go into some of those aspects um and um it's it's again it's a fairly detailed uh, or, or specific subject um and again uh, there's many old uh hydro hydroelectric and hydraulic tunnels around the world as i showed in that previous chart on some of the failures many of them are getting into way beyond their design life and therefore clients are recognizing that it's important to inspect them um, they're not easily inspected, of course. They have to basically shut down or have an outage, and so that's a loss of revenue. Obviously, other tunnels uh, can be uh, planned for um, uh, outages, you know, and, and to stop operations to get in there and do manual inspections. And there's, uh, with that, there's, you know, different methods that are available out there uh, to, to look at concrete linings in tunnels if you have manual access. So, a lot of different, um, again, aspects and technical considerations uh, to address with the inspection of tunnels. But again, it's trying to um, confirm their integrity for continued serviceability, basically, is what we're, it's all about. So it's just a follow on aspect after we have built some of these uh, or put these projects ourselves. Uh, another subject, again, of, of um, let's call it of, of, of limited. Um, interest perhaps to some degree, yeah, but it's about the renovation and, and repair of tunnels. And again, um, and and, uh, and even de uh, decommissioning uh, has taken place of some tunnels, believe it or not. But um, obviously when tunnels have been subjected to damages, repairs are in order, but uh, there can all be some, also some renovations as you can see there on uh, uh, making bicycle tunnels around the world there in Porto. Uh, we have one here close to Vancouver as well, where they've converted old railway tunnels into hiking trails and things of the sort. <clears throat> and um, obviously those have to go out and get examined and possibly upgraded to uh, acceptable safety standards to now allow the public to use those facilities. Um, or if it's the widening of existing railway tunnels or for uh, double stacking of cars, 
and, and things of those nature. So different aspects, again, uh, regarding renovation and repairs of tunnels. So now I'll jump into uh, some case histories and, and just to show maybe just to rattle through these because there's a number of them and all I was planning to do is uh, present uh, a number of them and some high level comments on them. And going back to one of my favorite and, and first projects of my career at, in Lesotho back in the 1990s. And uh, there I am uh, drilling up the Katsi Dam uh, in my younger years when I had hair. Uh, but there were some important lessons learned from that particular project that's that's mentioned, and and uh, there was a lot of publications uh, in 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 presented, and even a specific Sankot uh, conference uh, on the project at the time during construction. And so, and we've had recent inspections of the tunnels to show that they are all in good condition, and uh, they've been surviving, and they were all well designed and constructed. So there was some really good practice, but there were some really good uh, lessons learned as well during the early stages of, of those projects. Um, this one in, in Hong Kong, shallow urban tunnel where there was uh, the, the support system had to be changed because we had very limited cover above us um, and we had to be careful uh, using the right type of support such that we wouldn't have a collapse and not have a uh, Hong Kong streetcar come into the tunnel, of course. Uh, Taipei Ring Road in Taiwan. Uh, we had major deformation on a particular tunnel there. Um, when um, uh, removal of the bench, these were major traffic tunnels and uh, some very difficult. Taiwan has some of the most uh, adverse and challenging geology in the world, uh, given its uh, location on the, um, on the uh, Pacific Rim in that area. Uh, similarly, in Turkey, another another country with very challenging geology and the ch and the, and the challenges of uh, doing large traffic tunnels through some of that, in, in also an active seismic area, and and the experience of large deformations and trying to come up with adequate support to build those types of tunnels. Um, the uh, the major rail tunnels uh, recently completed in Switzerland. Um, we actually, I was involved in the exploration tunnel that we used the tunnel boring machine. So it was a major contract, uh, advanced contract on its own to learn about a particular formation uh, with high groundwater pressures <clears throat> and where we experienced uh, some very significant overstressing and rock bursting just in that exploration tunnel to be able to access what we were going after at the time. Uh, this was our local project here in Vancouver, I mentioned before, where we also had rock bursting conditions and, and again, lessons learned of doing adequate testing before construction. Um, similar in uh, Niagara in Eastern Canada, this was a shallow tunnel, but also subjected to very high in situ stresses, which is unique for the particular basin in, in the um, Toronto region of Canada in the sedimentary, horizontally bedded sedimentary rock there, and the use of a large diameter tunnel boring machine uh, that uh, experienced some very challenging stability conditions during excavation. And whether or not that was the right approach to use or not, uh, one can question obviously after the fact. Um, project here, water supply in, in the Southern California, and some of the, the challenges of going through. Uh, this was more related to uh, the environmental impacts of the project where there was limitations on the amount of groundwater inflows that could be, uh, that could occur to the tunnel and measured at the portal because the, um, uh, an indigenous group had the rights of the water supply and actually had a uh, bottling water plant in the region that, that was being affected by the uh, construction of the tunnels. Uh, this is our uh, uh, first uh, subway tunnels here in, in the city of Vancouver. And part of the uh, construction actually used the, the, I'll call it the ancient or historical method of cut and cover, as you can see on the right hand side, which caused a lot of havoc and disruption to business owners along that particular section, whereas in the downtown section uh, or in the central section, they use traditional um, TBM 
methodology with precast and they could have used that same approach in the other commercial district and so there was a large legal dispute about the whole construction project unfortunately um, <clears throat> this was another local project uh, that was built a fairly short uh, hydroelectric tunnel and it was built with uh, no or basically limited investigations there was one laboratory test done from a piece of rock from the quarry and so the contractor took this on at, even at a fixed price was a, which was a pretty uh, pretty gutsy approach for them to have done but uh, we ended up getting through it we only hit one major fault uh, so it wasn't so bad but um, anyways we got I think we got lucky we could say on this particular project uh, another one in northern northern Canada here where um, I thought it was of use to to look at um, uh, the importance of making sure that we have the, the portals located in the correct locations uh, on surface and we're not into drainage locations where we can create problems for ourselves during construction and obviously to just try and site portals in the most favorable geology as possible to limit any delays because they are critical path components of any project to get established and in particular if they are intermediate access addits to, to help uh, shorten the overall construction duration of the project. Uh, this project in, in Peru, uh, one of the major long and one of the deepest tunnels in the world that experienced uh, ongoing rock burst conditions, uh, which was very challenging using a, using a tunnel boring machine and they switched over to a special type of uh, support referred to as the McNally tunnel roof support system. You can see in the right hand side there. Uh, that that allowed them to safely uh, go through uh, and continue, but obviously at a much lower rate of advance. So it had a huge impact. But again, limited investigations and limited uh, identification of the real risks that could have occurred on that project. Um, this was one of the actual collapse projects uh, that, are, that occurred. I mentioned on the, the hydroelectric tunnels, this one in Panama. In, um, in the sensitive volcanic geology of, of Central America, uh, where first time saturation of uh, volcanic tufts and, and what's called there, they're the famous red tufts, uh, very, very sensitive and non-durable type of rocks. Uh, this tunnel had to be built uh, in, in a very um, uh, condensed um, period because the, the, the owner uh, had a contract to meet for the delivery of power. So that did not allow for the concrete lining of the tunnel. And therefore they, they constructed a shotcrete line tunnel and it actually survived for nine years before it finally collapsed on multiple locations. And again, major repairs that were then required and they ended up concrete lining the, whole, the entire tunnel uh, afterwards. <clears throat> this project in, uh, in Chile, uh, where the contractor decided to introduce a tunnel boring machine for a very short tunnel as part of a, let's call it a training program for what was expected to come as a second project immediately after this, but unfortunately didn't happen. But uh, here you go in a, in a two kilometer tunnel, what could go wrong? Well, they hit a buried river valley in the middle of a rock bluff that they didn't expect and they ended up taking out large boulders as you can see in the upper left side there something that uh, typically is not expected to be encountered going through a rock bluff in the middle of the andes in south america and again uh, this project's actually not too far from that previous one where again we have our famous red tufts and, and the non-durability of that moisture sensitivity of this type of rock uh, and it's important recognition of that for um, getting the, the, the investigations correct of how much of this to, uh, exists on a particular tunnel alignment. And then of course, what type of um, final linings are going to be appropriate for this type of geology. Uh, one of the other uh, tunnel failures that occurred there, this one is the Glendo in, in Scotland. Uh, this is, was finally resolved in the courts after 10 years on, on um, who was, who was ultimately uh, responsible. But um, this was again, just a, a six kilometer tunnel that, that collapsed soon after commissioning uh, where um, there were some clear indications of uh, uh, 
and, and, and knowledge of an existing fault zone, as you can see there in the bottom. Uh, there was a drill hole into it. They attempted a raised bore shaft nearby that was unsuccessful, even with the pilot hole for the, for the raised bore. So that was some clear red flags in the early days. But when they passed through it with the tunnel boring machine, it was all considered to be fairly stable ground. And therefore, there was no requirement. And under a design build, fixed price type of contract, of course, the contractor is not interested in installing any heavy support or concrete lining. And, um, and lo and behold, unfortunately, that's uh, a collapse occurred shortly thereafter. And so one of the comments that was made by uh, even Professor Einar Brock from Norway, who was involved in the project, uh, and, I, and I had the opportunity to talk to him about it, was essentially um, the, T, the TBM excavation masked or sort of hidden the stability of that particular fault zone. And that's one of the benefits, of course, of TBMs. They don't shake up the ground as much. But if this tunnel would have been built by conventional drill and blast, they probably would have had some major fallout at that particular fault zone. And it would have been supported with much heavier support or even concrete lining. Uh, and then not to have experienced the, the collapse that did occur with commissioning. Um, an interesting case here in eastern Canada at a deep mine. Uh, down at 1,500 meters in telt schist geology, so very highly squeezing ground. Uh, we had um, ongoing deformations for 18 months, but the client was obviously interested to lay down <clears throat> the rail track for a long haulage tunnel as, as soon as possible, but that was not possible with the ongoing ground deformations that were occurring. And uh, the question was, should we take a civil engineering approach when we build this tunnel? Uh, to, to install high capacity deformable supports versus traditional, uh, let's call it uh, lower capacity mining grade ground support and allow it to deform and then just uh, uh, rehab the, the tunnel multiple times. And that was ultimately what was selected to, to allow the contractor to advance and get this section through because it, it ended up only being a 700 meter long section but it had a huge impact on the overall project. Um, one of my favorite projects here up at 5,000 meters elevation in the Andes in Chile and Argentina, where a four kilometer conveyor tunnel uh, was passing underneath glaciers. And because we were basically in the halo of, of one of the biggest porphyry deposits in the world, we had, we had acidic ground and groundwater and the rock bolts, uh, the contractors were reporting the rock bolts to our office after 75 days, telling us uh, we better do something about it. And uh, the intention was to install the permanent conveyor hanging from the ceiling. So that was a particular problem. This, this uh, project uh, ended up being shelved for environmental reasons actually in Chile, but uh, it was a uh, quite the eye opener to see um, how fast corrosion can really occur in, in groundwater with uh, I think the pH was two or 1.8. So highly aggressive and, and that's what it does even to a shovel after that same duration there that's left in a pool of water in the tunnel. So hence my earlier comment about making sure your groundwater conditions and chemistry are, are looked at as part of your characterization and the, um, the intended design life of your particular tunnel. Um, one of the uh, long TBM tunnels uh, recently completed in Chile, um, some difficult uh, geology there. And again, this was a good lesson learned that there was an intermediate access at it um, for this particular project, but it was cited, unfortunately, to go through a number of faults and it resulted in a number of delays just to get the intermediate access at it started and to launch the TBM from that particular area. So again, the importance of locating your intermediate access at its in good geology or low risk geology, if, if possible, or that's what your target should really be um, to try and prevent any major del delays to a project. Um, here in Panama, again, Central America, we have high risk geology with our young volcanics and uh, high, high groundwater pressures, high permeability, uh, lahar type of geology. And if we put tunnels through this rock, 
we can expect high groundwater pressures. And so there's some very unique challenges associated with that, making sure that we, if we're using tunnel boring machines, using the right type of machines that can handle that type of geology and groundwater pressure, uh, obviously versus um, conventional means that would be unacceptable because they typically result in major impacts to the groundwater regime and there's local communities in many of those areas. So very challenging uh, construction methods to be used in those types of environments. Um, this was again one of the historical types of uh, hydroelectric tunnels that, that collapsed way back in the 1950s and lessons learned. Uh, 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 an extension of the project or expansion was recently completed and adopted uh, the more low risk approach of, of uh, precast concrete linings to finish the second tunnel on the project. And, and uh, so that was good to see that uh, that, that design solution was adopted and, and uh, everything was successful to complete that on time. Um, this was another project in, in Chile recently, uh, recently completed on excavation and just going through commissioning now, a major hydroelectric project just outside of Santiago, uh, over 70 kilometers of tunnels, two major underground caverns, one at great depth where that experienced a lot of rock bursting and, and had safety issues and ended up uh, introducing specialized um, uh, mesh. And there you have the Geo Brug um, rockfall type of mesh being used in an underground application. So very unique, obviously more expensive and, and timely but very effective in, in that particular use for deep excavations and, and for safety reasons. Um, here, here's a, a much shallower project in Toronto in the, in the Georgian Bay Shale Formation uh, that was subjected to a lot of deterioration during construction that was not expected by the contractor, even though he was given slate durability testing. And, and even though slate durability can be a, it can be a useful indicator type of test, it, it has no relation to the impacts of certain methods of construction and therefore has to be very careful. And it appears nobody has sort of established the link uh, between slate durability and constructability or let's call it, um, you know, moisture sensitivity and such. And even though that's a detailed subject, but. Uh, you can look at uh, what happens to invert rails on a TBM tunnel that can uh, cause derailment and everything when the invert softens up um, because of even just uh, natural humidity and moisture impact. Um, because even in this situation here, there was there are actually no groundwater inflows coming in, but um, just that relative sensitivity of this type of rock and its impact on construction methods. Um, long uh, 26 kilometer drinking water tunnel for the city of Kathmandu in, in Nepal uh, was constructed under conventional means. A lot of good rock at the time. Um, the team that started the project and, and designers and such did not have any experience with TBMs, unfortunately, because um, in, in hindsight, we could have said that this project uh, could have been built much faster. It ended up taking 10 years unfortunately, and a few contractors because of other contractual uh, challenges. But interesting enough, in um, 2015, there was the major earthquake in Nepal, and it actually did cause some cracking to the shock creep lining that was installed in the tunnel uh, at depth of as much as 500 meters depth. So it was an interesting case to see uh, seismic damage um, in a, in, to a deep tunnel section that no one expected. Mm -hmm. Uh, another tunnel uh, recently completed, first TBM tunnel in Nepal uh, and completed ahead of schedule, which screwed up the entire project schedule for the client. Um, typically doesn't happen, but sometimes, and um, uh, obviously uh, to, to the benefit, but uh, introduced other challenges, but it was also uh, completed through one of the major Himalayan thrust faults that, that uh, basically I think they went through the fault in 35 meters a day. So didn't have any impact on the uh, TBM excavation. And again, they adopted the approach of using precast concrete lining and uh, they're gonna be using that TBM and same approach on a second tunnel coming up. So they've, they've demystified 
in some ways the Himalayan geology, although this this section of the Himalayan geology is much more simplified than than other areas in India and, and Pakistan. But um, um, so far, um, uh, it's it's good to see the success of, of the TBM being used in Nepal and in in the Himalayas. Um, this was a uh, most recent uh, another collapse of a, of a hydraulic tunnel associated with uh, a major um, hydroelectric dam in Colombia. You may have heard of, but it's uh, it has unfortunately resulted in the largest insurance claim in the history of construction. Um, and so all our insurance friends in London were very nervous about this. Um, but basically it was um, a major hydraulic or hydroelectric dam built with traditional, uh, the original design was twin uh, diversion tunnels as, as normal practice in the industry. And during construction, it was changed to a single tunnel uh, and they experienced multiple um, wet seasons during, during the uh, multiple years of construction that led to very high velocity flows through the single diversion tunnel, which was obviously under design capacity. And that resulted in a major collapse and um, the risk of overtopping of the dam, which was not, it was about 80% completion at the time. And therefore they ended up having to open up the intakes and destroying the entire powerhouse by passing the water through rather than risking the overtopping of the dam impacting communities both downstream and, and even upstream. So um, a major um, situation and um, challenges that, that occurred on this, but some fundamental questionable design decisions during construction that were made. And uh, I think one of the last ones here, this project in Peru, Again, uh, goes back and uh, talks about basically the design of, of uh, hydropower tunnels in particular geology. And in this case, in, in highly permeable uh, and karstic uh, limestone geology where there can be major leakages occur. And when you build tunnels through that, uh, and in particular sloping tunnels that uh, result in increasing pressure downstream, um, you have to make sure that you're relying on a very low permeable medium to have your unlined tunnel within. Otherwise, you're going to be required to concrete line or steel line a tunnel. And this client unfortunately experienced the problems of not being able to fill his tunnel for operations and led to major delays of installing extended lengths of concrete lining and steel lining in the tunnel. Um, the El Teniente mine in Chile, one of the most famous and major underground mines in the world, uh, undergoing expansions with a new block cave level and new access tunnels, twin nine kilometer tunnels that's been ongoing for a number of years. Uh, we were part of the, was part of the team for design, build, procurement for this to uh, let the contractors decide how to build it. And in the end, even though we received uh, bids by tunnel boring machine, uh, the drill and blast method was selected by the client and it's taken many years um, for completion under high cover. Rock bursts have occurred. They've had some fatalities uh, and it's, it's again, it's, uh, they've had just some very unique challenges of, of again, associated with the deep tunnels uh, to, to finish this particular project. A uh, new project uh, still not yet underway in uh, in India after after many years of planning and design the importance again going back to confirming your conditions at a portal and in, in the lower left corner there <clears throat> they thought from the geophysics without a drill hole that they had bedrock <clears throat> and unfortunately there's large um, fluvial deposits laid up against the major valleys in the Himalayas and they gave this portal the new name of Boulder City uh, and that unfortunately prevented the launching uh, of a TBM, you know, in what typically is desired as a, as a good rock outcrop <clears throat> and required the excavation of a major cavern in soft ground or overburden uh, to allow the TBM to be launched. So a five-year delay basically has occurred um, because of um, uh, an inappropriate uh, uh, tunnel portal location. And I think this is the last one. 
um, uh, project in Ecuador. Again, the uh, hydraulic tunnel being filled uh, with very low cover and inadequate uh, final lining below the tunnel for the actual pressures resulted in a major surficial landslide above uh, and, and collapse into the tunnel and surface material coming into the tunnel. So again, uh, you know, the misidentification of the tunnel passing below a gully or a low cover area uh, and the, um, the erosion risks that occur that are commonly associated with hydraulic tunnels. So that's it um, in terms of the, the presentation and uh, I'm happy to consider any questions if we got some, some time left or a short version thereof. Uh, thank you, Dean, for a very uh, comprehensive overview of uh, various tunneling applications. It was extremely interesting. I, I do have several questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, so I'll go to, um, I, th I think we'll give it, we are out of time, but I'll, we'll give it five minutes and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, the first is from uh, Jaya, Jaya Sankar. Um, he has said, what would be the adequate borehole spacing for, um, cast, for a caustic geological profile like the one seen in Centurion, South Africa? And, and sorry, the, was, he, was he relating to a particular project? What, what was the name there you mentioned? Um, I, he hasn't given a project. I think he's just referring to uh, okay. a dolomitic caustic uh, type okay. geological okay. profile. Right, yeah, and and I um, I didn't say too much about karstic uh, uh, conditions, of course, but but they do, of course, represent very high risk um, conditions for for any proposed tunnel, and uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> other case histories uh, in the industry um, that I'm aware of that that uh, that the challenges of and it, especially for shallow tunnels with what could, if you have deep weathering. You can have a, obviously a very highly variable and uh, uh, top of rock profile with incised channels. And all of that justifies not just drilling, but even additional methods. And, and what are the most suitable, say, geophysical methods that should be used to basically almost generate a complete profile along your entire tunnel and then target your, your drill holes you know, based on that. So again, it goes back to having a well-planned, multiple-phased investigation program, whereby you are you are gathering um, information that you can then build upon to uh, gain greater confidence and reliability on your overall profile and identify and and then target drill any particular areas. But you're in in a situation like that, you're going to be looking at high-density drilling, of course. Um, you should not be, hopefully your client's not limiting the budget on drilling, but I think you need to take advantage of the lower cost methods of geophysics to look at full profiling of an entire alignment. Very important. Monique, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Dean, I'll go to the next question. It's from okay. Andrew Officer. He said, uh, is the depth of the tunnel not a major variable in terms of the guideline for geotechnical drill length? Um, the main target area would be the zone around the tunnel alignment. Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, that's that's also one that's been debated in the past. And, and the question uh, or reflects to to say for deep tunnels, why are we drilling or core drilling all the way to depth uh, if we're only interested in you know the uh, the last fifty meters or whatever it might be around a tunnel? Um, but again, that depends on your overall the complexity of the geology along the alignment and deep 
cord boreholes can also give a lot of, um, I won't say supplemental, I'll call it even primary information about the variability of what to expect even along the tunnel. So even drilling vertically or subvertically, you're, you know, you're looking at the, uh, the mass properties of a particular formation. If you're drilling one drill hole per, per rock type or formation, um, yes, you can say that we're, we're, we obviously are interested in do those properties change with depth, for instance. And so that's another reason why to consider the long drill holes and coring and even testing on a profile basis. I also like to see that in terms of permeability testing, where there is the general uh, decrease in permeability with depth, but not always. We can, we can have uh, inversions at depth or high permeability zones at depth or open fractures even in, in, in hard rock conditions. So um, I know if you're, if you're under budget limitations, uh, and actually, but I've also seen that drilling contractors don't even offer a discount for non-coring of, of deep holes. They charge you the same rate. Um, but if they do give you a cheaper rate, then you can certainly consider that and say, we only want to core the last few hundred meters, but I wouldn't limit it to only, you know, 10 or 20 meters at the bottom of the hole uh, at tunnel elevation. I would try to look at at least a minimum of say 100 meters um, or 50 to 100 meters in the tunnel zone to, to gather additional information of, of all the relevant geotechnical information and, and properties in that, at, at, you know, near tunnel elevation. Okay, thanks, Dean. Um, I think I'll ask one last question. Um, it, it was asked twice by both uh, Jaya Sankar and uh, Jan Peter. Um, it's with regards to um, a tunnel seismic prediction system. And from a risk management point of view, how significant is this uh, the application of this geophysical method in the case of high overburden tunnels, long tunnel drives, um, and especially related to risk and mitigation? Yeah, so I'm, I actually, I, I, I know I didn't mention that, but I, it is included in my book and I've recognized it. I actually, um, uh, dare I say, I was a past employee of Amberg Technologies or Amberg Engineering in Switzerland. Um, so I'm very familiar with the, the method and, and I've seen it used and, and, and have, uh, are, uh, I'm a big fan of it. I'd like to see it used on more. I've tried to actually specify it on more projects for that particular type of application for deep long tunnels where we may have limited uh, investigations or typically do, of course. Um, and therefore we are using um, explore, exploration or pre-advanced techniques during construction. And as long as we can fit those in, whether, and, and nowadays the TSP does work, um, you know, uh, it can be used on, on TBM drives and the like, um, whether or not they have to be specifically only used on maintenance shift uh, when there's no background noise going on. But again, um, it has its limitations. It's a geophysical technique, but it does allow us at least to look out hundreds of meters. It's a lower cost approach. Uh, my understanding, I mean, uh, the guys do a good training program either for the client or the construction supervision consultant to be able to handle it themselves. Uh, I think they still sometimes refer back to the actual manufacturer for assistance on interpretation or troubleshooting. And that's, that's always a good follow on service to request from the manufacturer. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of any methods. And, you know, we all know how expensive um, core or cover or probe drilling can be and its impact on, on production, of course. So it, you know, it's an alternative um, I, and I think a useful and, and efficient lower cost solution that can provide additional information. But I think also it still needs to be supplemented. And if you, if you are picking up um, high risk zones with that particular method, that then typically warrants to say, okay, we, then we should consider also introducing cover drilling and such in case we have to do pre-excavation grouting ahead of us. Uh, but that, that type of method can hopefully help us identify those particular high risk zones. Okay, thanks for that, Dean. Um, I'm going to um, 
ask if you could kindly respond to the rest of the queries online um, or offline rather, uh, because we've gone over time. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just like to say thank you once again and hand over to Gerard. Thank you, Monique. Uh, so just for all the attendees, so Dean has kindly agreed to respond to the remaining queries um, post, post the webinar. So we will send it out to all the attendees once we get it back from, from Dean. But just to wrap it up, thank you all for attending. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And Dean, thank you to you for an excellent uh, presentation and, and the case studies at the end were most interesting. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all. Until next time. Thank you, Dean. Thanks. And and can you? Uh, I was just trying to check how to. Uh, is there any way to print out the Q and A, or can you and send that to me? Uh, we'll get Google to um, put them in an email for you, Dean, and then uh, get it get it through to you. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.